What's up, everybody, and welcome back to episode 154 of the Designated Players Podcast. In this episode, it's still MLS history, and it's all about record-setting games and fantastic seasons. We will start with Clint Mathis's five-goal game versus Dallas, a record that still stands to this day for most ever goals in a single game. Then we will move on to the story of the 2000 KC Wizards, just two years removed from their Olive Garden preseason diet, who go on to win both the Shield and the MLS Cup Double. My name is Andrew. I'm here with my good buddy, Connor, and this is MLS History Retold. Connor, how you doing, buddy? Considering this is our third episode recorded today, I'm tired. <laughs> yeah, and you're probably upset because you're going to have to watch... Uh... Listen, you've got Atlanta guys in your team. You have to root for Atlanta, too, today. Uh, I have to root for uh, a 4-3 game with four goals from Almada, four assists from Giacomakis, and three goals from uh, Sequet. That's what and I'm I am, I am all on board for that. <laughs> Considering we have the same players. <laughs> um, I want to know what your scarf is. I don't, I mean, we've had our little chat. We've been talking for too long. What scarf are you rocking now? I don't think you're going to want to know what my scarf I is. I know. I already can see it. Yeah, it's I ugly. don't have an SKC scarf, but considering their colors are similar, I got the NYC scarf out. It's upside down. I'm really good at scarves, guys. I never claimed to be good at scarves. Uh, but yeah, uh, there you go. That's all right. That's not too bad. Uh, Clint Mathis, a legend on the Metro and also a very good U.S. men's national team player. I figured I'd break out the One Nation. One team. I get it because he played for Red Bull and he also played for men's national team. So Scarf does both of those. Where's Fun. the you've mentioned that? Where's the Red Bull in the scarf? The Red Bull. Ah, okay. That's fitting then. The U.S. All right. Shall we just jump into this? Yes. I think we should. I'm going to start because last time we did, I got really confused. <laughs> Go ahead. So I'm going to start with my boy Cletus. Clint Mathis, Cletus to those who knew him closely, and one who is argued as one of the Metro Stars' best ever players, is a man who can label himself many things. A men's national team player, a men's national team goal scorer, supporter shield, MLS Cup, Gold Cup winner, donner of a Mohawk, but clearly his most prized title is MLS goals in a game record. It's August 25th, the year 2000, and the New York, New Jersey Metro Stars are taking on the Dallas Burn. Cletus joins the team studded with talent, including Tab Ramos, Tim Howard, Mike Pecky, and others, to take on a Dallas side that is pushing to get into a playoff spot. Cletus was a marked man in 2000 MLS for his ability to terrorize defenses either through scoring goals or setting up teammates. According to reports from our good friends at MetroFanatic.com, he was the type of player that just got you at the edge of your seat every time he touched the ball because he always was going to make something happen. And in this game, he made more than just something happen. It seems that he made everything happen for the Metro in this 10-goal thriller of a game. He would get the party started in the third minute. Alex Comas played him in on goal with a very cheeky back heel. Cletus took a touch with his left foot and fired low into the bottom left corner for a 1-0 lead. 20 minutes later, he went back at it again. Comas got Metro on the counter, bearing down on the Dallas goal. Fired a shot low to the right of the goalkeeper, who was saved very well, but right into the path of Clint Mathis. Follows it up quickly, tucks it into an empty net. Things are flying well for Red Bull until literally four seconds later, when Dallas scored directly off the kickoff to make it 2-1. On 40 minutes, Metro pieced together a really nice attacking move, seeing the comas Cletus connection back to work. Comas hit a nutmeg pass with the outside of his boot into the path of a cutting Clint Mathis, who takes his touch around the defender and rifles a pass a goalkeeper to make it 3-1. A hat-trick inside one half. But no Metro story is complete without a little that so Metro moment, right? After the second half kicked off, Dallas would score three unanswered goals in 20 minutes to make it 4-3. to three. 
basically erasing everything that Clint Mathis had done. From oh so good to oh so bad, oh so quickly. But Cletus was having none of it. Him, he didn't have a mohawk at this time, unfortunately, but I just imagine him with his mohawk. Whoosh. Four minutes in after the Burns' fourth goal, the Metro get a corner. It's flicked towards goal, bounces off about 100 people, and falls to the foot of Clint Mathis, who nearly broke the net, rifling this thing home to tie the game. This goal tied the current MLS record set twice by Metro villain Jaime Moreno for DC United earlier in the league's history. We will get to a whole story on Jaime Moreno later this series. The game would remain tied for 15 minutes until the Metro worked their way into the box and earn a penalty. Mathis steps up, sends the goalkeeper the wrong way, and slots home his fifth goal of the match, breaking the record for most goals in a single MLS game, a record that is still standing to this day. Adolfo Valencia would add a sixth for good measure, five minutes later, just to cap it off as a 10-goal thriller. Thriller. This win earned the Metro the Eastern Division title, and at the time, an MLS best 51 points, setting them up for a run in to the end of the season that could win them their first piece of silver. The 2000 Supporter Shield. With two games left, all they needed to do was hold off the Kansas City Wizards, who were one point behind them, and they would win the Shield. So how would this work? Their very next game, they'd lose 4-0 to the Miami Fusion, who no longer exist, and then lose to New England 4-3 on the final day to lose the Shield. That's so Metro, baby. Listen, buddy, you're stealing my flow, all right? You already spoiled half of what my story is, all right? Hey, you can tell the story. I got a question, though. Why is he called, is his middle name Cletus, or is that a nickname? He's from Georgia, uh-huh. and he looks like a farm boy. Oh, so, okay. Uh, Cletus is his a nickname. A play on a Clint? Yes, it's a play on Clint, but uh, there's actually a whole thing when he, he had left MLS for a little bit to go, I think, to Greece. And as RSL were starting up their expansion team, uh, there was a whole article that said, why Cletus, why now? And I read it through, and it was basically just inter- interchanging kind of the way I did between Cletus and Clint. Cletus and Clint. Cletus and Clint. <laughs> very, very fun. So, um, yeah, it's it's very cool. It's funny because most of the time that you hear Cletus, it's the it's paired with him as like a 32-year-old dude with a mohawk. So just kind of fits the whole southern southern raised farm boy vibe. Very nice. Very nice. Well, you know who was one person that I'm sure was very grateful to not have to face Cletus every day in practice. How about a one Tony Miola? Go. Part of the 2000 Kansas City Wizards team. As always, source for this one, uh, just Wikipedia. I mean, Wikipedia has obviously got their sources, but um, that's what I will be leveraging to talk about the 2000 KC Wizards season and I'm not spoiling anything by putting stuff in the title even though Andrew already spoiled half of it because he sucks the year is 2000 the KC Wizards to this point in their existence have not won anything despite finishing second in the supporter shield in 1997 and having an MVP in Preki however the winless Wizards were about to be no more The team consisted of plenty of big-name players that many today even know about, such as Tony Miola, Preki, current boss Peter Vermees, Chris Henderson, and Mo Johnston. The roster was strong enough to right the wrong of the nearly wooden spoon season of 1999. And right the wrong they did. And what better way to kick off the season other than absolute firecracker of a game versus the Chicago Fire, where they won 4-3. This would kick off one of the best starts in MLS history as they then went unbeaten in their next 11 games with nine of those being wins. In that stretch, they conceded just twice while scoring 21 goals. Absolutely dominant during that period. However, once that spell was over, they fell back, they crashed back down to earth and they crashed back hard. Um, The following games... They got six points from their next nine matches. 
I mean, based on what they did in the first 12, that is an absolutely uh, complete 180 in their form. However, uh, well, almost so. Okay, so the fall off for uh, these games is almost solely due to the lack of scoring, considering they scored five goals in that nine game stretch. Uh, however, they would find a bit of better form to finish off the season uh, with five wins, four draws, and two losses in their remaining games, bringing their final record on the season to 16 wins, nine draws, and seven losses. Certainly a massive step up from the season prior, but where did this leave them in the standings? They finished on 57 points, which is the exact same number of points as the Chicago Fire. So it comes down to goal differential, and KC edged them out by two goals, meaning that they were crowned sh Supporter Shield champions. So obviously this came down to the final day of the regular season, where KC entered the final day being two, uh, having a two-point advantage over the Chicago Fire and the Metro Stars. The Metro Stars lost their final game against uh, New England, as Andrew mentioned. However, um, they would have needed a decent amount of help in this last game in order to win the support shield anyway. The fire, however, uh, saw off the crew to win three to two. So the pressure was on KC to respond. They faced the Tampa Bay mutiny who were a strong team that season. They finished fourth in the final standings and they found themselves down two zero in 33 minutes. Things were not looking good. Um, however, they just needed a draw. So this game was certainly, it was certainly not out of reach for them. And Chris Henderson breathed a massive, uh, breathed massive life into KC with a 42nd minute goal. So going into halftime, they're only down two to one. Just one goal is all they need in order to win the supporter shield. And KC got that goal that they needed. Uh, in the 66th minute, they got a goal from Miklos Molnar, um, and were crowned supporter shield champions. That's how close it was winning Sporter Shield this season. Crazy close. Three teams technically still in it at the end. So, as we all know, though, this isn't Euro Snobland. So the season isn't over yet. We've still got playoffs to play for and a potential double for KC to get. Uh, side note, I only say double because KC lost their opening U.S. Open Cup match this season to the Chicago Soccers. And no, it's not soccer is like S O C C E R S. It's soccer is like the socks on your feet. So, uh, not the best moment this season. Uh, it could be so it could be socking like boxes, boxing. Uh, but uh, yeah, not a great result. Regardless, it'll add probably allowed them to focus on the league and get them to this point anyway. So, probably a good thing in the end. Uh, so just a reminder for the playoff format: it is a best of three series where scored as three points for a win, one point, uh, and one point for each draw. So KC was matched up with the Rapids in the first round, where they promptly took care of them. Uh, they won twice and drew once, giving them seven points and a trip to the semifinals, where they would face a dangerous LA Galaxy side. And these two teams were very evenly matched, and it showed in the series. It was, an abs it was a 0-0 absolute barn burner in the first match, uh, followed by a 2-1 Galaxy win after sudden death extra time. Then, Casey had their backs against the wall. It was win or go home. Uh, and so they did what they did best all season long. They played impeccable defense. They shut out the Galaxy this game, which allowed a 20-second minute uh, penalty from Molnar to be the, to be the deciding goal. Uh, however, this meant that everything was level on points and thus prompted the sudden death extra time or essentially golden goal. And just six minutes into sudden death extra time, Molnar would find the winner to send the Wizards to the MLS Cup final. And in said final, what more fitting opponent than the one they finished level on points with, Chicago Fire? This was the ultimate matchup of best attack versus best defense, as Chicago was the top scorers and KC the best defenders. Lucky for KC, this game played out exactly as they wanted it to. It was a defensive battle between both sides, and the lone Molnar goal uh, 
ended up being the deciding goal to win the KC Wizards, a supporter shield and MLS Cup double, cementing this team season as one of the best in MLS history. Now, I want to dive into team stats and awards a bit to end things off, but there is someone I want to mention. A name continuously kept coming up during talk of the playoffs for the Wiz that I didn't mention at the start of the episode. It won Miklos Molnar. He finished as top scorer for KC with 12 goals, uh, which didn't say much considering the team scored the joint fourth lowest goals in the season. However, this man was Kobe Bryant level clutch for this side. In the playoffs, he scored five of KC's eight goals to help them win the cup, four of which ended up being the game winning goal for KC in their games. Uh, I believe that uh, him, I believe he was the leading scorer in the playoffs as well with uh, five goals. So he was incredibly clutch for them. Uh, He only played one year, by the way, for SKC. He came over from Sevilla, played one season for SKC, and then dipped. And I don't think ever played in MLS again. But what a way to go out. Um, So now into the stats and awards a little bit here. So the team finished with the best defensive record in the league, only conceding 29 goals. And if it weren't for the Galaxy, also being a super strong, uh, also being super strong defensively, they would have been the best defensive team by an absolute by absolute miles. Um, the Galaxy conceded thirty seven that year, and then the next best was the Revs conceding forty nine. So, if it weren't for the Galaxy, they would have been the best defensive team by twenty goals. Absolutely incredible. All of this resulted in a plethora of awards for the SKC defense, including Vermees for Defender of the Year, Tony Miola for Goalkeeper of the Year, Tony Miola for Comeback Player of the Year, and Tony Miola as MVP, the only goalkeeper to win MVP to date, and honestly, in my opinion, likely the only one that may ever win it, the the only goalkeeper that may ever win MVP award. Do you have something to say? Why'd you unmute? (laughs) <laughs> additionally uh bob gansler won coach of the year for skc after helping turn a nearly wooden spoon team into a double winning monster this season the kc wizards helped prove that defense does in fact win championships is that it that's it i was trying to time when you were finishing so i could unmute at a proper time well, you didn't time it very well. Clearly. Um, yeah, that, that you ended it the way I was going to end it. Defense wins championships. We talk about it all the time. Sometimes you don't have to have the best attack if you have the best defense. And this team proved it, right? And you, you can turn... It, it also shows... And this, this, I think, really is an example of how important that parity is to this league. You went from being almost the worst team in the league to winning everything the year after. Like it, it gave incentive to those owners who were a part of it that it wasn't going to be a two person race from the get go. Everybody had a chance to be successful. Everybody had a chance to make money. And that's truthfully why I think people left their their investments in. They knew that they had an opportunity. However, even if they had one bad year, it only took a signing or two to turn it around. That was the important part of, of this whole thing. So, again, a very important moment in MLS history where that had to be one of the first times ever that a team went from worst to worst to first, right? And that shows how important that parity was to, to the league. And I think we're losing it a little bit now, personally. However... Uh, it's not necessarily a bad thing because we're we're at a stable enough point where we can have a little bit of separation. But back in 2000, if it was, you know, the same four teams running away with it over and over and over again, I know DC and Chicago were up there, but if there was no shot, I feel like a lot of those owners would have just said, "Eh, there's no point in this. I'm I'm wasting my money." And would have would have dipped. Yeah, I think it's a good point. Uh, one other thing I did want to mention, I'm not saying. He- I'm definitely not saying he didn't deserve it. Um, I think he absolutely played well enough to earn the award, but I'm very surprised they actually gave the award to a goalkeeper that year. Not to say like, again, Miola had 
He had over 50% of his games were clean sheets, and he had 82% save percentage. It's unreal. It's MVP worthy. I'm just surprised that they did it because there were other guys that were definitely like attacking players who were in the conversation who also had like really good years. I mean, uh, it was uh, let me find it really quick. It was Mamadou Diallo had 26 yep. goals that year, and Clint Mathis had like easily 20 plus goal contributions that year as well. And they were both finalists. So I'm a bit surprised they actually gave it to a goalkeeper. Yeah. And I agree with your, your assessment too. I think that'll probably be the last time the goalkeeper ever gets it. The lake probably was pretty close, but with the way that money is spent these days, nobody's going to, nobody's going to vote a goalkeeper in that spot unless they are next level. Unreal. Like Blake was close. You to be better than that. I don't know. But anyways, yeah. Agreed. I appreciate, I appreciate everybody for listening. If you, uh, if you enjoyed it, please make sure you leave a like subscribe and pass it around to all your friends. Uh, we got more MLS history on the way. Tons of it. Um, I don't quite know which ones are next. Actually, you have it up. I do. What do we got next? We've got, Oh my God. Could you have picked a longer title? Columbus Crew versus Metro Stars PK shootout in U.S. Open Cup when two refs were used as a FIFA experiment. <laughs> so I added this today. So in my in my review of uh, Warzika's goal, I'm I'm looking through the Open Cup because um, I was looking at the end of the season for the Crew, and I saw a game that was eight seven in the in the uh, Open Cup. I'm like, there's no way. So I dove into a little bit. It was penalties. It was one one six seven on penalties. So they made it 7-8. I don't know why. But I look in, and there's this little asterisk at the bottom of the, the scorecard that's like, two referees were used for this game as a FIFA experiment. And I'm diving headfirst into this. I need to know everything. I need to know it yesterday. And I need to know it like the back of my hand. So we're definitely covering that one. Okay. And then the other one is one that we briefly covered in this one, but can definitely dive into more details. Uh, the... In 2000, it's the only sudden death mini game in MLS history in the uh, Western Conference Finals versus the Galaxy. I think I, I briefly, I think I might have briefly mentioned it. It was that uh, third game against the Galaxy, where they went in, they were tied on points, so they went into sudden death extra time, uh, where Molnar scored. Gotcha. Okay, we we uh, might maybe, cover maybe that. we can cover that one. Maybe we'll, we could talk about it offline, but yeah. But anyways, we've got tons of early MLS history leading up to more more recent stuff. I mean, we're in the year 2000 now. We're four years old as a league in, in terms of our history recovery. So uh, continue to uh, support us and, and you'll keep hearing more of it. So um, thanks so much again for listening, everybody. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, make sure you follow us wherever you get your podcast uh, and make sure you're following us fresh. And make sure you're following us anywhere uh, on social media as well. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, or TikTok. Uh, just search the Designated Players Podcast and we'll pop up. So thanks again for listening, everybody. And we will see you on the next episode of the Designated Players Podcast. See ya.